people of color in this country have been time and time again displaced from land and removed from that connection with nature. We're known as a place that preserves like the culture of Puerto Rico and speaks about social justice with the youth that we serve and through the work that we do. We try to connect them with the music, we try to connect them with the language, we try to connect them with the food. The key to health is through a lot of these natural practices that we've been losing and forgetting. The more and more we can connect to what keeps us independent, what keeps us self-sufficient, what keeps us connected to our culture, and being able to provide for ourselves is super important. The simple act of planting a seed and eating that food is tremendously liberating. North Square Neighborhood Project, it's a bilingual community center uh, in West Kensington in North Philadelphia. It's existed since 1973. It was founded by a teacher, a professor, and a group of Puerto Rican women activists named Grupo Motivos, um, who were trying to create a safe space for youth in the neighborhood to like learn about their culture and the environment in like a culturally grounded way. These ladies will like incorporate themselves with the kids and they will teach them how to cook that will teach them how to um, do sofrito and teach them how to um, listen to the um, music, the kind of bomba plena. That will teach them how to make different types of clothings and, and fabrics and, um, and paintings. Folks were going to schools and then they weren't learning anything about Puerto Rican culture and they were not like learning about Puerto Rican food or any of those things. There was like this disconnect between their culture at home and their culture like in school and in like other settings. The way that our gardens were created by Iris and Tomasita and the women of Grupo Motivos was through struggle. Taking back like the land, creating these spaces for healing. Because a lot of the reason our gardens exist is because there was a federal raid in this community where over 60 community residents were arrested. These folks were involved with like the drug trade, but these were like fathers and cousins and family members and mothers. And so this was like a great community trauma. And so all of our gardens come out of that trauma because it was a way of like creating a space to heal and reflect. The way that we do programming is that like we are always inclusive of like youth ideas and like the way that youth want to incorporate things within the like project-based learning that we do. And so that's just like one way we try to develop youth leadership because ultimately the way that like social services and like community services and things like that are structured is it's very like folks from the community are serviced at or like are the recipients of services and they are not like the people who are delivering services and like doing things within their own community. A lot of times, like we see the environment movement as very white, and so you see environmental movements like trying to then diversify and reach out to communities of color and see how they can get buy-in, which is totally different than a community group based in a community of color, like engaging or like realizing ties to the environmental struggle. We started a program that we had piloted last summer called Rice is the Cambio, which, or Roots of Change, it's a youth farm apprenticeship program that's based on the idea of like cultural preservation, youth power, and food justice. So in each like cohort of Rice is the Cambio, which la usually lasts about like like a quarter of the year, like four months, like three months or so, we have a core of like eight youth who learn about urban gardening. They become like peer educators for the other youth in our other program about like food justice and like preparing food in a, like a healthy way while still doing cultural foods and stuff like that. So the garden that we're sitting in right now is called Las Parcelas. It was started to get built in, I believe, 1984, and it was completed in 1998. It's a community garden with um, over 20 garden plots for community residents. This community is always changing, so our, like we have Palestinian garden members, Puerto Rican garden members, Korean garden members, all growing food together and, and finding ways that they're, the foods that they grow within their cultures have crossover with Puerto Rican culture. Iris likes to talk a lot about the idea of tertulias, like it, the idea of like sharing food and culture and you'll bring like, you'll bring beans and you'll bring rice and you'll bring other things and we'll cook together and we'll connect and we'll bond and we'll get to know each other and build community together. Within the space we have the casita. 
Oh my Lord, when I walked into that little casita, I was like, I felt like I was walking into my grandma's house. Seriously, because as soon as you walk in, there's this little salita with the rocking chair, with, with, with the pelcha, their little clothes, the moquitero on the bed, la friambrera, where they put, used to put lunches at. Um, a guido, la guitarra, the sink in the outside. I don't know if you guys have seen that some in Puerto, some houses in Puerto Rico used to have their sinks outside the window. So this casita has the sink outside. So they also build on the other side of the gardens, El Colobos, three, these three African um, huts with their African stories. It is a garden that celebrates um, the African diaspora in Puerto Rican culture. Um, Iris Brown, who created the gardens, is from Louisa, where the culture of the folks there is like very like Afro-Caribbean. It's where a lot of the culture of Puerto Rico comes from. And so she wanted to create a space that like talks about that because often in Puerto Rican culture we don't talk about how the like the African roots of like many Puerto Rican people in a way that's like strengthening as opposed to like not strengthening essentially. So Raíces Garden was um, established in 1980. It is a garden that explores Puerto Rican history. It has a large mural that um, showcases um, everything from the indigenous Taino, the first people of Puerto Rico, to um, the enslaved Africans that when they were first brought there, the Spanish conquistadors, all of those things, as well as like various like aspects of Puerto Rican culture. Of the kids that we serve, the majority, like 60%, are Puerto Rican. I would say we're Latino. Like we serve some folks who are like newcomer immigrant youth from like Central and South America. When you immigrate to the United States, you, and Puerto Ricans are immigrants in a lot of ways, even though it's like a part of the United States. You, you have to fight to preserve your culture and, for the, and the culture for your kids. All of our cultures came from interactions with the earth, right? So like holidays, traditions, the foods that we eat all connects to some earth-based whether you're from East Africa, Western Europe, Chile, far Southern America, like across the world, we come from the earth. Generally, it's like we try to be as open as we possibly can and we're trying to, we're, we want to start doing something where like folks on the block can be like garden members, but like in a different way that doesn't have community beds, but just so that it's like free for them and also so that they like have more buy-in with the spaces. I think that overall, like we have a positive reputation within the community. The fact that we have a center for Puerto Rican studies is something that you can't get anywhere else. I'd say it's probably the most important research resource for anyone learning about the diaspora. The Centro pinpoints and expresses what Puerto Ricans are all about. And the journal is unique in that it is the only journal that publishes research articles on the Puerto Rican experience. It holds our history and protects it. And without Centro, all these materials would be in jeopardy. We came here because our government and the U.S. government facilitated the exodus of Puerto Ricans. You go where the jobs are. The CML was established in 1895. It also happens to be the genesis of the Puerto Rican community. You know, they, they put them in the dorm. You know, they weren't allowed to go past a certain block. And they, they were called, you know, specks and brown bags and all that other stuff. You know, we have gone through it, we have lived through it, and we have uh, maybe arrived at the other side or were close to arriving at the other side. Consequently, there's a lot of people coming out of Puerto Rico because there was like um, a depression, you want to say? Lack of work. When the steel mill in 1947 established a hundred million dollar expansion and they also had a tremendous problem with turnover, they had something like a 98% uh, turnover rate. The S.D. Friedman was very knowledgeable of Puerto Rico. He basically, Friedman was raised in Puerto Rico and was very knowledgeable of Puerto Rico. Mr. Friedman uh, was, uh, they commissioned him to get some people from Puerto Rico because the steel mill needed them. So they brought a group of Puerto Ricans over here from then, you know, to, to work at the mill. 
and my dad was one of the group that came over here. And you have to have a letter from uh, the, the police uh, uh, chief of your community. You had to have a letter from the priest. You had to have a letter from the mayor. And you had to have a letter from some outstanding citizen in your community. And you had to have all that before they would talk to you. They got those first 500 young men. And they got the cream of the crop. Because there were stories about the brown wave and the brown invasion and all this and that. And when uh, they brought them here, they had them live in barracks on company grounds, and for a long time they weren't allowed out. So they were secluded, segregated, and locked down. And then finally, after time passing, they, they, got, they insisted more on wanting to come out, and they had a very difficult time because nobody wanted to rent to them. The courage that our first generation must have had, because they, they came here not knowing the language, not knowing how to live in the cold, and not knowing where they were going to live. Now back then, there was no place that they would rent to us. It, uh, it, it was bad. Um, so Mexicans gave us basements or attics to live in until we were able to get it together. They built a whole community on the other side of the tracks. And believe me, it's really like that. I grew up on those tracks on that side of Campito. And it was well known, oh there, that's Campito, that's, that's Puerto Rican. So, El Campito begins here. So the, the first, one of the first houses, if not the first that the men from Puerto Rico brought, was actually part of a barracks. Because they were bricklayers, they were masons, they were carpenters, they were plumbers, they were electricians, they were doctors, they were nurses. They created institutions and they helped create sacred heart. They had the Puerto Rican home and other clubs. And so they created a social network of, of family and friends that was almost insulated up from the rest of the community. Our community got so well grounded here that there was a street in Lorraine called Vine Avenue. And Vine Avenue was Spanish, all Spanish. A lot of Mexicans who were here first, but mostly Puerto Ricans. And all the stores were Spanish owned. All the signs down the whole street was Spanish, and it became Little Puerto Rico. There were so many different clubs, you know, like the Lattes Club, the Duado Club, San Lorenzo Club. So there were, uh, yeah. people would gather there and they would have different activities and not just, you know, everybody went. And, so, so. and there was a, a lot of social gathering and then the church, Sacred Heart Church uh, Chapel was, it was a big influence. And articles have been written because of the, concentration of Puerto Ricans on Lorraine and the impact and the fact that many of them had very good jobs at U.S. Steel and at Ford Motor Company. They were homeowners, many were business owners, so the economic stability and the social stability was fantastic. The economy started to turn in the 80s and there was, you know, jobs were, were shipped overseas or perhaps to other places in, in this country. Um, there was a lot of economic hardship, but there's certainly the anchor here that's continued to keep the community strong and continue to keep things evolving. And so I think the community uh, continued really to uh, progress, uh, you know, more and more of our uh, peers, our uh, their children uh, continue to go to college. They are involved in the medical area. They're lawyers. There's a police chief, our, our uh, high school principal. Uh, members of the Board of Education uh, had become active. And of course, they were able to re remind those involved in educating the children that, you know, that we have Latinos here. And then eventually the bilingual program came to be. This is where our roots are right now and uh, that we want to continue to grow this community and I think Lorraine is better off. My name is Isha Marie Renta Lopez. I am the founder and director of, of a bomba group called Semilla Cultural. I never thought that I would be doing traditional dance uh, ever. There's a, a special connection between the dancer and the main drummer 
where the dancer will be improvising dance movements and the drummer simultaneously uh, gotta try to play them in the drum. I should be able to follow what she's doing and try to get her energy and try to transmit it back so that energy continues flowing. Bomba is a traditional uh, music and dance form uh, developed by uh, the enslaved Africans that live in the island. And it requires a singer that will be uh, with the chorus and it'll be a call response uh, type of singing. Traditionally, percussion instruments, drums, maracas, and a pair of sticks called kwa, and a dancer. So it kind of becomes a, a challenge, a dialogue between main drummer and dancer, and then there's other drummers that are keeping the basic rhythm going. In the fall of 2006, I joined Raisa Seborinken, uh, which was a folkloric dance group. And they would do Bomba and Plena. And from there, there on, they had a very good, well-established group. Unfortunately, after 2010, it kind of started winding down. People started moving away. Some people decided not to keep going to rehearsals. You know, I don't consider myself an expert, but I think I knew enough that I could share what I, what I knew. I had this knowledge and I realized it didn't belong to me. I thought, well, maybe I could form my own group. What if I do like a pilot workshop in my basement? Let's see if it brings enough people. And from there, if there's enough interest to kind of like build up a group. And from there, it's been a great journey. The effort of a lot of the ambassadors in the island and outside of the island is paying off. In the last decade, when the Bombazo started, people started learning about it. I think people started connecting more with their heritage and, and their identity. Para mí, para mí la bomba es esa conexión con Puerto Rico, a pesar de que estoy lejos, me mantiene conectada con, con mi islita. Um, es esa comunicación entre la bailarina y el primo, representando toda la cultura bella que nosotros tenemos, y es ese ritmo, esa pasión que, que lleva la bomba en sí. As a, a director of Semilla Cultural, you know, an ambassador of, of bomba in the area, it comes with a big responsibility of, of Make sure that I give the right information. Cuando estén bailando, cuando estén tocando los cuales, las maracas, tocando los tambores, tienen que transmitir todo eso que sienten, todo lo que es la bomba es para ustedes. So, sin más preámbulos, vamos a seguir tocando. I will also make people feel welcome. You know, that just because I'm from a different culture, it doesn't mean that I'm going to put a wall between us. On the other hand, no, I'm going to open up everything that I know and share it with you. And at the same time, I'm open to learning from them. As part of the group, we do a lot of, uh, not only practice our songs, but we also do developmental and, and dynamics between the group to think about Bomba not only as, as music and singing, but also, you know, how did you connect to it? Like we've done uh, group dynamics, like uh, describe Bomba in one word, or saying one word, why are you here? And, you know, that was a very interesting conversation because some people say, you know, we give me power or it makes me feel free or um, it's, a, it's a necessity in my life. Okay, for me, the bomb is a conversation. A conversation between the primo and the dancer. A story that takes the masses of the dance with the entrega and much more. A moment where I leave what I leave. I think I leave and I leave and I don't have to worry about what happens. It's a moment of intimacy. It's a moment of donde somos todos, pero yo sigo siendo uno, ¿verdad? Y para mí, pues, a mí me cura. I say it's a conversation because I feel that, you know, you're connecting with someone, but you're not using words. You're using your physique, and he's using his hands. You're telling a story while you're dancing. So, you know, as a viewer, I, I expect that you can feel that story or you can see that story happening based on, on my mood or, or the emotions that I can uh, transmit through the dance. Doing the, the right tones and playing the rhythms the right way will take a lot of dedication. You have to practice a lot, do rudiments, and you know also develop a muscle memory. Make sure you don't get tired because you can be playing for hours or you can be playing for 15 minutes. So you want to. It takes a lot of dedication. So it's you know individually it depends, but I've seen people develop in months 
and other people years, so it depends. La Milla Cultural definitely has, has gotten a lot more attention than what I expected. It's a great feeling because I've get contacted by some people from Puerto Rico, you know, supporting us, letting us know that, you know, you guys are doing a great job, you know, you gotta do, this, what you're doing is right, and I feel that, you know, what we are doing is, is the right thing because it looks like we're filling a gap that, that was needed. I think all people think, you know, you mentioned they're from Puerto Rico and they think about arroz con gandules and they think about platanos and, you know, they think salsa. They don't think bombón plena because they don't know it. So I think the fact that you're not doing a popular thing that is in place in the radio all the time, but you're doing something a little different that has a, a deeper background and a stronger connection to the heritage, I think that, that uh, definitely brings people to, you know, to get more interested in the culture. And some other people feel that they can connect somehow with African heritage or Caribbean heritage. Some people are uh, Puerto Rican and they've never seen that before, so they feel like they just found their one, you know, an identity that they didn't know about. La música siempre es algo que llena el alma. No importa qué, qué tipo de música sea, pero reconectar con mis con mis raíces de nuevo que las tenía hace años cuando estaba allá, pero es volver a aprender todo eso es es reconectar con las raíces de uno. Eso me mantiene una sanidad completa y se olvida uno de, de los otros problemas que tendrá. The fact that I'm in the U.S. makes me want to go back to kind of like get that experience of Bomban Plena in the island because I didn't have it when I lived there. But at the same time, the fact that I'm here bringing Bomba to the community here, you know, makes me feel more, you know, connected that I'm doing something right for, for not only for the local community, but something for my culture. He was able to pull people together he was also one that did not focus solely on the Puerto Rican experience in New York, but made bridges to what was happening on the island, what was happening internationally. I, I think he got his power from being so rooted in the community. He changed the discourse. He made us talk about ourselves in broader terms. Working in Humble Park, I have found that a bicycle can be an excellent tool to help build community. And really what West Town Bikes has become about is being a community builder. The Division Street Business Development Association is a non-for-profit chamber of commerce, community development organization based uh, in Humboldt Park. We provide technical services to small business owners here in the city of Chicago. We're tasked with working to keep and maintain longtime businesses, as well as accommodating new businesses that will fit into Paseo Boricua and really stabilize the corridor with anchor businesses. I became executive director in 2009 in February and the executive director of West Town Bikes, Alex Wilson, had been under negotiation with the previous executive director as well as the Puerto Rican Cultural Center to create a partnership that they can open up a sales shop in our business center, which uh, was created to be more like a small business incubator. And so we would help to incubate uh, them and their business. Around 2008, uh, we had been at our location on North Avenue, just north of here, for about four years. We'd been outgrowing the space that we had there, and we'd been serving Humble Park for about four years and had made lots of good connections, and we knew that this section of Division Street, Paseo Bariqua, was really the heart of Humble Park. It's very pedestrian, it was commercial. You know, it's the, the strip that it has the history and culture of Puerto Ricans in Humble Park. And they had become 
really large partners of ours. Uh, at that time, we were thinking about opening up a sales shop. So all of those things combined had us uh, really looking at Paseo Barricua to, to move to. They were willing to do work to build out half of the, the space for a sales shop that they can sell products and, and work on bikes uh, that would generate money to fund a lot of their programming. So the first thing we did was obviously uh, discuss a name that would fit Paseo Boricua. We met and we discussed ideas and finally we settled on Ciclo Urbano. Another aspect of fitting in was obviously to have staff that also reflected the greater community. I think that it's great that the young people that we've developed who work at our, at our bike shop uh, and are the young people from the community and that they've really embraced it and that they are able to do uh, an outreach uh, to their friends and their neighbors and it gives uh, a sense of ownership not to just those who work here but to the, to the larger community that Ciclo Urbano is Humble Park's bike shop. Through their programmings at schools like Roberto Clemente and like uh, Alviso Campos High School and other schools in the area, they have uh, trained young people from the neighborhood that have gone through their program and they now work as bicycle mechanics at the bike shop. I think all of our staff, except for the manager, are all youth that have come through our program, which is amazing. Teenagers can get lost for various reasons, whether they come from a good home or not a supportive home, um, they would find their ways to the streets and the streets would swallow them up and spit them out. So here, I love this place because I feel like we not only do we do youth empowerment and development, but I feel like we also do a lot of mentoring. Bike Club is a drop-in program, not necessarily a curriculum-based program. It's some sort of an open shop. Uh, we open up the space uh, for kids in the community, in the neighborhood, and for you know, young people from all around Chicago uh, to come in and use a professional bike shop space, at the same time receive opinion, uh, instruction uh, about their projects, or maybe building a future project, at the same time getting the opportunity to earn a project like a bicycle. It's not just about riding your bicycle, it's not just about bicycle safety, but also the other great opportunities that come about from just staying engaged. Started coming to the bike club, did like three years of all the internships, apprentice, uh, bike club, everything else. And got my job in the front. Everything that comes in, I, I gotta go over it, assess bikes, book in the tune-ups, do the tune-ups and run the floor pretty much. It gets pretty busy. So now these kids are realizing, hey, if I put in that time, I can, just, I can be just like this kid that's up front ringing me up or wrenching on my bike. Five years back, the bicycle was looked at as a tool of gentrification. It was, it was an elite type of tool until this organization came into Humble Park and then it was kind of shown that, you know, a bicycle, it's not just for this certain type of people, you know. A bicycle is for everyone. This is another asset, you know, this is something else that we as a community can use together to just better our people and better our neighborhood. Humble Park is a very vibrant community uh, that's rich uh, in culture and history. I think that Humble Park is, has been a great uh, learning experience for me and how do you engage people who are different than you. And I am seen as different, and I think that my, my differences are often very obvious just by seeing me. Yeah, I'm the, you know, I'm the weird white guy with the glasses and the hair who rides bikes, right? Like, that's kind of a given. Once you can set those differences aside, we can, we can really address a lot of our, our similarities and our common cause, our common goals. In many ways, West Ham Bikes is focused on youth development and how do we engage young people at a time that uh, they are impressionable and they are making some big life choices and help guide them through those. More and more our programming has become focused on uh, employment, job readiness, job training, uh, and how do we prepare you to have a job. And really exciting work that's going on now is how do you take those job skills that you've learned, that experience that you've gained, 
and how do you reinvest that back into the community? And that's some really exciting work that we're doing right now is the young people that we've developed, how do we make them our future managers, our future directors, our leaders of this work that we've begun? And I find that very, very exciting. that we've been having a parade for more than 50 years. So a lot of people think, oh, you know, this just happened. No, it's been happening for a long, long time. Hartford's population is mainly Puerto Rican. It's, it's a very high number of Puerto Ricans just in Hartford, and it's been that way since the 70s. Our community has been in Hartford for about 50 years, so since, since the mid-50s when the first migration came, we've actually had people move from Puerto Rico to here earlier than that, but when it really made an impact, was in the 50s when all the um, farmers were coming out to work, the tobacco plantations and the farms. CICD stands for Connecticut Institute for Community Development, uh, Puerto Rican Parade, Inc. That's the name of our organization. Um, we are the um, organization in Hartford that promotes our, the Puerto Rican culture uh, through workshops, um, events, and the Puerto Rican Parade. The parade started uh, 50 plus years ago, and it was a means for Puerto Ricans in the state of Connecticut um, to advocate for uh, things that they wanted to get done, like ESL programs that would benefit Puerto Ricans coming from the mainland to uh, the United States. We try to coordinate and collaborate with other parades and festivals throughout the state. Matter of fact, this year, um, the theme of our parade was uh, nurturing our community. Our message was to bring the, the uh, issues that are going on in Puerto Rico and try to help uh, our people in Puerto Rico by um, letting legislators know that we have this problem and that they should help Puerto Rico with the financial situation. I don't think it differs from the parades and festivals throughout Connecticut and even New York. We've had a long-standing relationship with New York also. We participate in the New York Parade, so, um, you know, we all have a theme that we abide by and we kind of all kind of get on the same bandwagon and, and, and that's our goal is to unite our community. We had about 70 units marching. We had uh, a combination of school groups to uh, bands, school bands, dance groups, uh, club, uh, car clubs, motorcycle clubs, just a little bit of everything, floats. We had our floats, our queens were there as well, our delegation and about, I want to say 2,700 people involved in just the parade marching. It was in 1991, actually. We uh, celebrated that festival at a restaurant called El Coqui Restaurant on New Britain Avenue, and it was in celebration of uh, Luis Ayala, who was uh, the treasurer of the organization for many, many years. Um, and we did it in a parking lot, and we just, you know, that was right after a parade, and we decided to do that. Um, it's grown to the uh, tune of bringing in up to 50,000 people at Bushnell Park um, we've had up to 40 vendors at one point. This year we were limited to 25 vendors. Um, we have, uh, we had, this year we had Domingo Quinones, Charlie Cruz, and a lot of local artists participating, Humba Caliente also. So we have live performances, um, a lot of vendors, even marketing people uh, that, uh, for organizations that want to just put their messages out. Um, 
And it's just a great event. It just strengthens us, you know, getting, uh, standing together, like I said, with, with what we're doing this year and collaborating with all the different towns in Connecticut for um, the issues that are happening in Puerto Rico. It just, you know, people don't realize that what's going on there. They're like, oh, that's, I've talked to people and they're like, oh, it's, that's not here. That is all está pasando en Puerto Rico. Yeah, but you know, financially, mm -hmm. it, it's gonna trickle down because we have all of these people leaving their properties what they, that they've worked so hard to, for in Puerto Rico, coming here with literally nothing and, you know, looking for services, which are being cut now even here for the people that are here. You know, people are being laid off. Um, it, it just makes it that much more harder for everybody else that, you know, that is, is already trying to fight a battle that we're not gonna win eventually, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the goal is for us to, to win that battle and just come together as a community and as a people, you know, um, and fight for ourselves. There have been times when we're standing on that stage and it's just so proud to see that sea of Puerto Rican flags out there against our, you know, state capital. It's just a, a great, great moment and a great thing to see. I'm a Rican, defining my own way, my own way, anyway. Tato is one of the most important New Rican poets, but he's also a major poet. He truly captured the essence of so many people who walk the streets of New York that no one sees and no one listens to and no one knows. Give us your tired, your beaten, your triste. Tato has written his legacy with the poetry in his life. Yo he eh, eh, denominado eh, del camino del aeropuerto a Melao como la ruta de la sabrosura. Se bajan del avión y la primera parada es Melao. Dicen, aquí llegamos, venimos directamente del avión porque ahí lo que dan son chips y nosotros queremos arroz y habichuela. Melao... Yo me imagino que cuando la gente ve, cuando los puertorriqueños ven lo que es Melao, ve como un sueño realizado, como un sí se puede. Incluso muchos comerciantes puertorriqueños, el primer punto de encuentro cuando vienen aquí a la Florida, vienen aquí a Melao. Estamos hablando de compañías grandes de Puerto Rico, que ya algunos se han establecido y otros vienen a establecerse. Y esto lo toman de ejemplo. Cuando van a la Cámara de Comercio de aquí de Kissimmee o de Orlando, una de las cosas que le dicen los de la Cámara y los líderes es que obsérvate Melao Bakery, mira el crecimiento, mira que si sí se puede. O sea, yo creo que mayormente es como un sueño, como algo que, 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 que podemos llegar y echar hacia adelante. Pero claro, es con mucho esfuerzo. Todo lo que la gente pudiera conseguir en Puerto Rico, queremos que la gente venga aquí y diga, eh, eh, me siento en Puerto Rico. En la comida tenemos arroz pastelado, pasteles, vianda con bacalao, cuerito, chicharrón. O sea, que, que la gente llega aquí y puede sentarse y decir, me siento en Puerto Rico. Gente que, por ejemplo, viene del norte de New York, que hace tiempo que no se comen una alcapurria buena, aquí tienen la oportunidad, cuando ven los pastelillos de guayaba, dicen, pastelillos de guayaba, wow. Así que me lava como que un destino más en Orlando. Ya no solamente vienen a ver a Mickey Mouse, sino que vienen a ver a Melao. Melao Bakery, queríamos, ser, queríamos, queríamos realmente buscar algo que tuviera que ver con lo que nosotros sabíamos hacer, que era repostería, pan, dulce, y queríamos buscar un nombre que fuera algo similar. Y también queríamos dejar saber que somos de una islita, también para que la gente, es como identificar un nombre americano con puertorriqueño, latino y demás. Y ahí entonces que es donde entra la, el, donde nosotros somos, que somos de Vega Baja, Puerto Rico, ciudad del Melao Melao. Lo que quisimos hacer aquí es mover nuestra isla a este lugar y gracias a Dios así ha sido. Por, porque la variedad de comida es tanta que, que, que es inmensa, o sea, pero gracias a Dios lo logramos. ¿eh? De Puerto Rico hacia acá, eh, lo que sí es exportamos lo que es la harina para, para producir lo que es el pan. Eh, exportamos para acá lo que es el café que lo traemos también, eh, se exporta también lo que, es, lo que es la malta, lo que son los refrescos que son típicos de nosotros puertorriqueños, 
O sea, pero lo demás se hace de scratch, o sea, se hace desde cero para, para mantener lo que es la frescura de nuestro producto. El mofongo. La gente le encanta el mofongo. La gente busca el mofongo para compartir. Yo creo que se sientan y dicen, ay, wow, me siento que estoy en la isla. Hay una gran mezcla de latinos. Eh, yo creo que como un 65, un 70% eh, son latinos eh, puertorriqueños. Y el otro, pues hay entre anglosajones y otras culturas. Ha cambiado mucho, eh, pero mayormente ha sido por cuestión de tráfico, porque claro, ha crecido en población, pero no veo cambios en cuestión de, de negativo o positivo. Básicamente todo está igual. Eh, gracias a Dios, está todo, todas estas personas que están llegando son gente que desean trabajar, gente que lo que están buscando es mejorar, ser, ser un, mejor, un mejor futuro para cada cual. Y eso es lo que ayuda a que pues, pues, eh, se mantenga básicamente eh, en armonía ¿no? y que esté todo bien. El entusiasmo sigue creciendo, la gente sigue queriendo venir aquí eh, y, y es simplemente por algo. Eh, aparte de la comida, es por el buen trato que reciben y, y, el, y el buen rato que pasan aquí. Nosotros estamos muy contentos de estar aquí, muy contentos de poder servirle a una comunidad hispana, anglosajona, eh, que puedan conocer los que no conocen nuestra cultura puertorriqueña, que puedan disfrutar de ellas. Al puertorriqueño pues que no se, eh, no se olvide de dónde salimos, de, de dónde somos, de lo que somos. Eh, y enseñarle a un país entero que los puertorriqueños podemos lograrlo, que somos valiosos, que podemos eh, aportar algo positivo a este país, a este país y que, y que lo que podemos dar lo damos bueno. Definitivamente invito a, a la gente a que, a que el sueño que Dios ha depositado en ellos eh, lo saquen afuera y trabajen duro para lograrlo. Dios ha puesto en cada uno de nosotros algo especial que dediquemos tiempo a averiguar qué es lo que Dios ha puesto en nosotros para poder bendecir a otras personas. Y en un lugar donde nosotros no es nuestro, una tierra que, que, que somos inmigrantes, poder llegar y bendecir a otro es maravilloso, es maravilloso. My name is William David Caballero and I am a multimedia storyteller, filmmaker, and in short, I like to tell big stories using small figures. I think being Puerto Rican uh, has prepared me to be a storyteller in this, this very moment of American culture. If you, if you look around, you see that there's a great push uh, for diversity and even more so uh, a responsibility, a, a self Uh, awakening to be responsible to tell your stories before other people tell your stories for you. I feel that I've, I've made a difference in the Latino community and the Puerto Rican community because I am, I, I believe, the only person working in this medium. I'm focused purely on capturing uh, my grandparents, as beautiful photorealistic 3D prints and presenting it in a way no one else has seen before. Most particularly, uh, my grandfather. And talk to me about gambling, how you gonna... Gambling? No, I ain't gonna tell you nothing about the gambling. What am I gonna tell you about gambling? Tell me about gambling. Like, play I'm, gonna play, I'm gonna play this lotto to see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you play for, for, for uh, let me see, for the whole month. He is, just has such a quirky personality. He's so loud and bombastic, and he thinks that whatever he says, you know, is the truth, and you can't challenge it in, in a very playful yet serious way. So I knew that he was somebody who had always, you know, that the, the, the audience has got him. And so it encouraged me, as the years went on, my grandfather left me voicemail messages on my phone. And these voicemails were, were warm and sweet, but also like, Hilarious and sometimes rude and offensive. You drop out of school, I'm gonna drop it in your head. I knew I wanted to tell a short film, and so I started thinking, you know what? 
3D modeling could work. That's the medium that I want to use to, to showcase my grandfather's voicemails. So I went online and I found a phenomenal 3D modeler. He loved the idea of, of being challenged to make my grandfather. I, I will never forget the moment I opened my email and he gave me the first model of my grandfather. I looked at it and I was just blown away. Hey, look like, you know, my name is my body. I'm not too sure like that. <laughs> this looks exactly like my grandfather. We painted probably 20 poses of Grandpa for this first short, first short film, which is called How You Doing Boy? Voice Moms from Grandpa. Hello, baby. I got to wish you happy birthday. I got three times you walk in the, in, the, in the apartment. Take care. I love you. you. Don't forget what I told you. Straight ahead. Straight ahead. Straight ahead. This short film I also submitted to festivals and uh, it got into several, but when it was done I put all the figures away and they sat in a box for a few months in my closet and then I realized why don't I, why don't I just try piecing it together and doing something where I could reuse these figures over and over again. And that's really the beginning of Grandpa, what would become Grandpa Knows Best. It was always important to me to have an interactive element where the audience can submit uh, questions for Grandpa to answer. No, I don't like live music. I hate that rap music. I know to put the radio to hear junkie, junkie music. You know, rap, rap music is no good for you. They don't, they talk, talk about nothing. They don't play you nothing. So why you listen to rap music? I, I wanted to present him as more of the universal archetype of what a grandfather uh, should and could be. The, the biggest compliment I would get from people was, wow, your, your grandfather reminds me of my grandfather. And these were coming from Latinos, white people, black people, uh, Arabs, Asians, Jews, everybody, young and old. So I'm working on a, a top secret uh, project now, a project that no one else has really seen. This actually uses a scene from my documentary, American Dreams Deferred, in which my grandmother and my grandfather are talking about each other. I don't do like I do before. One day, you know what happened? I went to see my friend, ahí está Marisa Crip. Cuando yo vine por la tarde con la nena para ponerle la cama, no había cama. Él la había vendido. And um, in the process of shooting it right now, Grandma's kitchen looks almost identical to her current kitchen in North Carolina. You know, I'm excited because this project is going to allow me to capture her unique identity, but also, you know, to have Grandpa have a little comeuppance as, you know, no more is he the only voice of the only person. Now my grandpa's gonna be like, ah, no one cares about you, you're crazy, you know? So I think it's gonna be a nice little counter to his uh, assertive personality. When I work on projects, my m mantra is empower, enlighten, and express. And usually I try to make sure all my projects satisfy those three E's. So empower basically means that I'm aware of the audience that I want to reach when I create this work. I want to empower them to also feel like they don't have to fit into this mold that society has set for them. I want them to be also awakened, whether it's in a very profound philosophical way or in just, you know, a more comedic way, like, like wow, like I could, I could do this too, that's pretty awesome. Enlightened is, is more of that feeling of creating work that satisfies me. I want to enlighten myself, I want to challenge myself, and I would like for the audience to also walk away with some of the art I'm doing feeling a little bit like, wow, he just made the impossible possible. And finally, express. Uh, meaning I always want to make sure that no matter what I do, it's creative and it's something no one has seen before. So I think Grandpa is like a huge luck success story. The show would later debut on HBO Go, HBO Now and HBO Latino in September and it actually made history. It was the first time ever in HBO's history that they, that they bought an interstitial series. Interstitials are what they show in between the, uh, the regular programming. So they had never done that. All their interstitials, I believe, were made in-house. 
And so here I was giving them something new. I create my work because I also wanted to influence that 12 year old Latino or black uh, underprivileged child who wants to put on TV and wants to see other people that look just like him or, or her also doing really cool artistic things. I want to be an example to those people. I don't want to be somebody who puts our culture down just to make money. At this moment, I have the freedom to tell my stories the way I want to. And if that means existing outside of the Hollywood sphere of influence, then I'm okay with that. The first story that I heard from my grandmother's lips, Pereza Martina has been my golden key in opening doors for me everywhere. It is just a fundamentally unique experience to read about characters that you can identify with. If you just read what she published, you would only have a fraction of a very skewed view of what she was writing. Thank goodness we have her archives here. In essence, it's always been my idea that the music would be the bridge between the cultural communities that tune in. That the language would always be the connector as well as I communicate. But it was also important for me to use the program as a venue for social transformation of the audience. For the Latino audience in particular, and particularly the Puerto Rican audience, I wanted it to be an opportunity of rediscovering our roots, our identity, and feeling proud about who we are, but at the same time, move us to start thinking about what is our role, not only here in the United States, but in the diaspora, and also back home in Puerto Rico, and Latino America in general. So the program had a social content that was based on empowering the listener. Empowering the listener so that he or she would take stock about themselves and how they are connected to everybody else. We're not just here as individuals, we're here as a collective. We're collective human beings, but we're collective also as an identified community of Puerto Ricans, of Latinos, of Afri African Americans, or others, but we are connected because we are identified through our identity. And it's imperative then that whenever we have an opportunity to communicate, and particularly through radio, we do so with a message of empowerment, a message of enlightenment. So the music that I pick isn't just what's the latest flavor. It's not based on what's the top hit. It's not based on what's popular. It's based on a series of criteria that I go through every week as to why I'm going to put these sets together that is either based on message, based on identity, based on social issues, based on um, a certain pattern that has to, you know, when you put five songs together, then it tells a story. And therefore, by telling the story, therefore, you are creating an envelope in which people can then start seeing, okay, I see what he's trying to lead me to start thinking about, wow, that makes sense, I understand. And with the sounds of Eddie Palmieri in the background, we start another program here on Consasa, a new edition, another chapter of the very best in Afro Latin music. Hoping that you enjoy the programming for the next five hours. Our number here is 617-353-0770. 617-353-0880. Hasta las 3 de la mañana con lo mejor de nuestra música afro-antillana. El número aquí en la cabina es el 617-353. So, for instance, if we were to talk about gender violence, right, and machismo, right? So you can pick a series of songs and put it together. And after you put it together, you can start seeing what the story is about and start reflecting on, is this really who we want to be as a society? Is this really the role of men in society? Is this the role of being a Latino man in society? Should we be path, moving this path when, in fact, we're inflicting harm instead of inflicting love, right? But the songs tell the message. So I use the songs as part of my preparation of the sermon, if you will, of salsa theology and salsa ministry during five hours because the songs tell the message, and all I have to do is just basically tweak it through my words and through what I'm saying 
in regards to the songs that I'm playing. So there's always a thought behind what I'm preparing because I want those five hours to be enlightening. I want those five hours to be transformative. I want those five hours to be memorable. I want those five hours to be impactful. And I want those five hours always just to be rejoiced and we want to dance and we want to have, you know, quiero gozar de la timba cubana y quiero bailar el merengue, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to make sure that what we are sharing has a certain standard of quality so that the audience appreciates that we can produce things that have impact in who we are and what we're about and our representation of who we are and what we're about. And so I, I, I take you know, great pride in being very selective of the music I'm playing and the artists I'm playing and why I'm playing these artists and how I'm sequencing the songs or the music, be it Latin jazz or be it you know, um, salsa or being whatever it is, there, there's a, a criteria that I go through in preparing the show. So it's five hours, it's like a book. So it's like being a journalist, right? I'm chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, five hours, five chapters that basically I hope will be uh, covering the things that I wanna enlighten people with. The majority of one community is still Puerto Rican. We are the overwhelming majority, but we're not no longer the only monolithic Latino community in the city. So part of that means then that we have had to be very um, adroit in, in A, being proud of our history as being change agents in this city and being the vanguard that allowed you know, a lot of changes to occur that others have benefited from, but also to be also understanding that we are part of a broader group of Latinos, which in my opinion, is what I call un pueblo nuevo, right? Because we all come from these different areas of Latin America, but it's only here in the United States where we're able to create our own set of who we are. And I call it un pueblo nuevo, right? Because as a Puerto Rican, I'm still Puerto Rican, but I'm very much engaged with my other brothers and sisters from the other parts of the Caribbean and Latin America, right? I have a strong affinity with Cubans as I do with Dominicans, as I do with Salvadorians, as I do with Colombians, as I do with Mexicans, because we are part of this un pueblo nuevo. But the Puerto Rican community still is a very strong, vibrant, thriving community. One that I believe um, is also at a crossroads because we're not so far from our island. You know, we have the advantage that others don't, that we can travel back and forth. And so we are concerned, as many are, for the future of Puerto Rico, that 100 by 35. We are as concerned to be part of the solution to whatever is happening in Puerto Rico. We want to be very much part of the discourse as to where it goes and how it moves forward in the 21st century. So we don't want to be seen as just, you know, we left and we're here. We want to be seen as we are here, we're contributing, we're thriving here, but we want to be contributing as to a thriving island from which all of us consider our motherland, regardless if people were born here and be a Victoria, South Bend, or wherever, Massachusetts, uh, or we were born in Puerto Rico. We are very much still connected to the island, and I think that's still very much part of who we are as Puerto Ricans. Thank you.